That's an appropriate title for now, the desert song, since we've been having so much rain. Amen. So we'll praise the Lord for the desert songs. So hopefully we'll be without that with all that we've been flooded through. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. And uh, we make do and we're flexible, amen, and praise the Lord we just have in church and around God's people. That's such an encouragement to be able to come together. Down. Down. Stop. Amen. To be able to worship together. Especially good to, for our first-time guests. We welcome you to our upstairs fellowship and our uh, worship center while our downstairs is getting uh, constructed. And we welcome you here at Believer's Fellowship. As you came in, you should have received a, a welcome connection card. If you take a few moments to fill that out, we'd appreciate it. And also, right down there on any need that you have or prayer request or any way we can minister to you or let us know personally the way we can minister to you or your family. And we consider that a great privilege. So uh, take that card and hold on to it. Once you fill it out, we'll tell you what to do with it at the end of the service. We'll like to exchange it for a free gift for you being our special guest today. So if you would, if you're a first-timer, just remain seated, but we don't want to Get up and walk around. So if you see a first-time guest, just stand up, look behind you, look beside you, but not enough room to kind of do a walk around. Greet our guests by just turning around and welcoming somebody beside you, around you. Give them a hug, give them a high five, whatever, just welcome them here, but kind of stay in your seat.
like so many in this area were facing flooding. We had it in the church last night. We're trying to pump it out at this time. Praise God for guys like Matthew Campbell and Phil Dutton who helped us try to get the building pumped. Earthquakes in Mexico that shook Belize even, and add to that the hurricanes and the storms. I, I do believe that God uses the events of this world to speak to people's lives. Amen. Big question is, are we listening to you know, what the Lord has to say to us? So uh, I just want us to be in a place in our hearts and minds to be attentive to whatever the Lord has to say to us and to his people. These are some interesting events that are happening and unfolding before us. Pretty, pretty regularly now. It's not like every once in a while. It seems to be that it's one thing, and then another, and then another, and then another, and another. They just seem to be one after the other. Uh, Dennis, 
wiggle that VHS cable there, or VTA cable, could you just a little bit? It's, it's like not that. It doesn't have to be very good color, but it gets a little loose at times. It's not that. It's not that, but well, what is it? Is that too? Oh, never mind. So it's all down, praise the Lord. <laughs> what am I telling you? One event after the next. Let's go home. <laughs> you ever feel that way? Yeah, I'm hoping for the big house home, not the one over there in Magnolia. I'm ready for that one. I think it's certainly appropriate that we start this series of messages in the midst of this mess having to do with matters of revival and revival matters. Because I believe these are things that should get our attention to realize, okay, God, what are you saying to me? Or what are you saying to the world? Or what are you saying to our nation? You can't help but read the scriptures and know that we are in the last days. It doesn't take a rocket scientist in the Christian theology world to figure that one out. Uh, unless you just choose to be an absolute ignorant. <laughs> trying to think something nice to say. No, just ignore. <laughs> Some mama said they can't say something. I don't say anything at all. Right? They just choose to ignore the facts and the reality of the world that's around us. Listen, uh, God is saying some things, I believe, at all times. I mean, the book, uh, the, uh, the Bible itself, the book of Revelation, closes with that. You know, let the Spirit, you know, as He speaks, let the church hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And I believe as we talk about revival matters in these days, that there are things that the Spirit of God is seeking to say to the church. And it's just a matter of will, be, will we be listening we talked a little bit about revival. Of course, we missed one Sunday with the hurricane, and the next Sunday we dealt with topics related to that. But I do believe, as we talk about revival matters, it is relevant to what we're, what we're facing and what we're dealing with. We talked already a little bit about the things that revival is not. It's not about mass meetings. It's not about excitement and evangelism and our events, because we can do all those things, and we have people saved, and we have revival meetings. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're having revival because you have meetings. It doesn't necessarily mean you're having revival because people are coming to know Christ. These are the normal affairs of the church. I mean, people ought to be coming to know Jesus. Lives ought to be changed. Hearts and homes ought to be affected by the spirits moving through our lives to other people's lives. But there are times in history, and I would encourage you to become a student of this and, and, and on your own, about when God did these incredible and supernatural works at unique times in, in, in the world's history. And realize, in looking at those things, that we are in need of a time like that when we desperately need, as a nation, for God to do something bigger than normal. Amen? In fact, I, I gave this definition of revival. So revival is the extraordinary movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of God's people producing extraordinary results. Are we up and running now? Yes. I think I have that definition right there. We talk about what is revival. It's an extraordinary move of God. When he just moves in, in, in more than the normal or more than the ordinary. By the way, if we're walking with God, it's ordinary for God to move in our lives. It should, we should be welcoming God's movement. Okay. But there are times when it seems to be over and above that. We doubt a little bit about what this word means. It comes from a Latin word, vive, which means to bring life. But revival means that there's a, a resurgence of life. Uh, there's a season when God kind of restores things. It's like the reset button is that we're back to the right place again. We're back at the beginning again to really be excited about what the, what the Lord is up to. If you study revival, uh, you, you begin to see that there are these extraordinary events that take place during those seasons and during those times. Like I said, I would encourage you to take some of your own personal time and do a little internet searching on the awakenings and the prayer revivals of the past, and the first great awakening, the 1800 prayer revival, the second great awakening, other events, the Welsh revivals, the Hebrides revivals. These are times when God just touched a country, a nation, a unique community for a, for a period of time where it was just over and abundant. In fact, I've written down some things here that what I believe revival when it's marked by these extraordinary things. One, it's, also, it's remarked first and foremost in all of these uh, historical events, it's a time of extraordinary prayer. When people, and sometimes it, it's just one or two that begin this process, but it builds supernaturally to where you have this spontaneous time, this protracted weeks or months of, of praying and seeking God's face. One of the great illustrations is that of uh, what's called the prayer revival of the 1850s. The prayer, prayer revival of 1858 specifically. There was a, a missionary, there was a lay missionary, a bivocational guy by the name of Jeremiah Lanfear, who was a lay missionary to the business people. It was his ministry to minister to businessmen in, in New York in, in the mid-1800s. It was around 1857 we had a big uh, crush and crisis on Wall Street. and Kind of like the, many people talk about the Wall Street events of the 20s. But we had one that preceded that in the 1850s. Before that, it had been a tremendous time of economic growth. It's the normal 
you know, wealth was being made and Wall Street was going crazy and all kinds of things were happening. But in 1857, it came crashing at the end to, of that year to a, a terrible halt. By the end, October of 1857, many of the banks in America were closing down, especially in New York. Stocks were falling dramatically. People were losing their, their wealth and their fortune. In November, in the presence of all this crisis, and the government ordered the military armed troops on the streets of New York in front of Wall Street there to keep the crowds that were gathering of hungry people, displaced people, distraught workers. They, they were gathering on Wall Street to break into the bank, the sub-treasury building there, and their goal was to steal the $20 million that was stashed away in the vaults there just to get by and survive. And it didn't happen, but the military protected it from happening. In September that year, also in 1857, is when Jeremiah Lampere, broken and burdened for that New York district, became very concerned about what was going on and decided he was going to start praying. He talked to a local church, a North Reformed Dutch church there, North Dutch Reformed Church, to uh, let him have a second-story room where he could start holding prayer meetings. He began just with himself and wasn't too long after that. He had about six people gathered. They gathered at noon for about 30, 40 minutes each day to just, just pray. The second week came, and people started noticing and taking interest, and about 20 people came and gathered in that little upper room there and prayed and sought God's face. By October, mid-October, about a month later, then they were having over 100 men meeting daily in that room to pray. And many of those men were lost and became saved through those prayer meetings. Wasn't too long after that, simultaneous prayer meetings began to appear across the state of New York as well as the city. In fact, they said within six months' time of beginning that prayer meeting in September, within six months, they said over 50,000 people were meeting daily at noon for prayer and to seek God's face for healing of the nation and for healing of the economy. Then one man who traveled from Boston to New York as he was writing in his journals, he said, as I would go from New York to Boston, it seemed that every town I entered in, thousands were gathering at noon every day in every church for concentrated prayer. God was doing a supernatural thing. Revival is always marked by that kind of commitment to pray and to seek God's faith. But it's also marked by tremendous conviction and repentance. That people become aware of their sin. And people become aware of God's presence and God's holiness and God's word. And they're, they're unsettled about it. Genuine confession begins to take place as they come under this kind of conviction. Genuine, genuine repentance. A testimony follows the people who say, I, I was wrong, and now I'm right. I was lost, but now I'm saved. I was backslidden, but I've gotten right with God. I was lost. It, it, tremendous things of, of brokenness and, and events of brokenness begin to happen. Samuel Davies said of the first great awakening, which was in mid-1700, 1730 to 1750, 55, and that range is what they called the, the first great awakening in America. That was followed by, if you've heard me speak on the history and the, of our forefathers and the founding of the nation, what led to that, I believe, was the first great awakening. These, these men had a real move of God and began to develop a burden for our nation and for how this nation would be founded and, and the principles upon which it would be founded upon. It was Samuel Davies who said of the first great awakening at this time, he said, suddenly a deep general concern about eternal things spread throughout the country. Sinners started uh, startled out of their slumbers, would break off from their sins and vices and begin to cry out, what shall we do to be saved? They said they made it great business of their life to prepare for the world to come. And the gospel seemed almighty and carried all before it. It pierced the very hearts of men with an irresistible power. I've seen thousands of men at once melt down under that grace of God, all eager to hear it's for life and hardly a dry eye to be seen among them. That's when break, conviction breaks loose. That's when God begins to move. When you have thousands of people getting convicted about their life and about their relationship with God that is so distant, and they get broken, conviction is felt, and repentance follows that conviction. But it's also, if you follow the history of it, it's a time of extraordinary love and extraordinary unity. There, the, a, a, this massive renewal takes place in these times. And it's renewal of a, a love for God, one, and two, a love for each other. That you begin to develop this new passion for God and for God's people. That it brings about an unusual unity among the believers. So all ranks and types and denominations of people that truly love Jesus seems to tear down all the denominational walls. 
Roy Fish, who is a distinguished professor of evangelism at Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, writing about these times. He said, undoubtedly, the prayer revival of 1858 did more to cement interdenominational relationships than any other single factor in American church history up to that time. What happened was, when God moved, the Baptists loved the Methodists, the Methodists loved the Presbyterians, the Presbyterians, <laughs> there was just tremendous unity among all those who claimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now that leads, prayer which leads to unity and to conviction and to, and to, and to that kind of fellowship, then that leads to what we call an extraordinary worship. Real revival brings about a deep, authentic, genuine, passionate heart of worship. People get focused upon the Lord. One of the great revivals of, of history was known as the Welsh Revivals that swept across the islands of the Welsh Islands. There was a newspaper called the, the Western Mail. They published this report, and this was written in 1904 when this revival took place. It says there's a remarkable religious revival that is taking place in Lahore. For some days, a young man named Evan Roberts, who was only about 20, 21 years old, a native of this city, has been causing great surprise at the Mariah Chapel. This place has been besieged by dense crowds unable to get in and obtain admission. For such excitement has prevailed that the road on which the chapel is situated has been lined with people from one end to the other. Many who have disbelieved Christianity for years are returning to the fold of their younger days. One night, so great was the enthusiasm invoked by this young evangelist, really by the Holy Spirit, that after his sermon, which lasted two hours, the vast congregation remained praying, worshiping, singing, until 2.30 in the morning. Shopkeepers are closing their doors early in order to get a place in the chapel in the evenings. People just can't wait to get to church. People can't just wait to congregate, to fellowship, and to worship together. There's no, well, I don't know if I'm going to go to church today because I, I missed kickoff. <laughs> That's not relevant. I don't want to miss the game or it's too nice or the lake would be nice. They want to be with God's people and God's presence seeing God move among his people. Which brings us to, I think, the next, and all these are like the dominoes that kind of stack up, that leads to an extraordinary witness, an extraordinary service. There's this incessant proclamation from the lives and from the mouths of God's people that begins to take place. They're excited about the gospel. They're excited about the good news. In fact, the good news becomes good news again. They're talking about Jesus. They're, they're ministering Jesus. There's the passion to serve the Lord and bring people into the kingdom of God that comes with these moments. An illustration of this is during the Second Great Awakening in America. The Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions was started out of the Second Great Awakening. People wanted to serve the Lord. Along with the American Bible Society began during the Second Great Awakening. People had a passion to take the gospel to the world. In fact, the first Sunday school union was formed in Philadelphia in 1791 as part of this awakening. It was the forerunner of what we call the American Sunday School Union, which was founded back in 1824, which is the forerunner of every small Bible study in the world that really takes place, where people get together and they study the Word of God together. All birthed out of revival and a passion for God to do something. There's an extraordinary, also, spiritual awakening that is among people who don't know Jesus Christ. As Christians become excited and empowered and infused with a desire and a passion to serve God and to share the gospel, the lost hear the message and the lost begin to get saved. Right. During the seasons of revival in the 1770s in Virginia, they said that the Methodist church population, the attendance increased by 1,400%. Now understand Virginia was a growing you know, province at this particular time in the 1700s, and the population had already grown by 200%. That's the population. We're talking about the church population. We're about 1,400%. In fact, they said the Baptist churches in Virginia, that every church had meetings that lasted five to six hours, often, get ready for this, all night long. People were just excited to be in the presence of God, God moving in such an extraordinary way. They recorded in three summer months of 1770, in three counties, the Baptist recorded in one county, 1,600 souls saved. In another county, in that month, all right, in, in this period of, 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 of in, in these three counties, in, in these three summer months, 1,800, another, 800 conversions in the third county, 
In those three counties, a total of 3,200 people came to faith in Jesus Christ in three small counties in three months. Can you imagine that happening? Even to that level, when the population is, is 100 times more than what it was then, even to see that many people saved in three months would be phenomenal. It would be incredible. During the prayer revivals of the 1850s, in a two-year period, they say that one million people, to catch it, sometimes these numbers just go over your head, one million people gave their life to Jesus. One million people converted to Christ. The population of the United States at that time was only about 30 million. If you're familiar with the census, uh, latest census records, you know the population in America is between 323 million and 326. That's the basic number, all right? If we would see the equivalent of that ratio, people saved in America today, if we had that kind of spiritual movement today, with a population of over 300 million people, that means that we would see well over 10 million people come to Christ Amen. in a year, in two years. Can you imagine that many people? I don't know about you, that, that, I just say, let it come, Lord. Let that happen. Wouldn't that be glorious to see that number of people coming to Christ? And you may be sitting there thinking, oh, well, you know, that's then, this is now. That'd be wonderful. I believe God's not done. Amen. I believe God's still working. I believe God's, when he says, I am not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the truth. I believe that God's the same way. I believe he's the same passion. I believe the power of the cross is still the same. I believe the power of the gospel message when declared by spirit-filled believers is still powerful. People can be saved. You say, why did it happen? Because believers aren't being what God's called them to be. And I think we should give ourselves to pursuing God for this kind of move in our nation. We are in a terrible place in America, yeah. not even counting the rest of the world. And I think at least here at Believer's Fellowship, we should understand the importance, and we should also believe in the possibility that God could do something of equal magnitude today. Amen. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. And God desires to do great things. Let me show you a passage from Psalms 85. And I think we'll see from this, we see why revival is so important. He said, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins, Selah. Think about that. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned away from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, mm -hmm. for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love, faithfulness, they meet, righteousness and peace. They kissed each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, Lord, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps the way. I think this gives us an illustration. We just break that chapter down to see all the Lord says to where this, this psalmist is standing. We're a people in sin. God, we need, we, we're, we're filled with iniquity. We need, we're in captivity. We're in bondage. We need your grace. We need your deliverance. We need your, your salvation. Turn your anger, your judgment away from us. Turn your anger from the folly of men's heart. Let men come back to you. That should be our prayer. This ought to be our passion. And I think it's important. I think it's incredibly important. And to you, let me give you a quick three reasons why I think revival is important today. This kind of kicks off more or less the whole study over the next weeks to follow as we talk about revival. I think revival is important because to disregard revival, to just blow it off, is to misunderstand and I believe completely miss the ways of God. Just completely miss what God is up to. You read this, you realize the psalmist clearly understood the need that was present in the land for God to do something. He saw all the sin. Now, if you study church history and you study the, these moments in history when revival took place and when God moved greatly, you will find out that each time that God moved, it was usually in times of terrible, terrible moral corruption and decay and moral indecency within a nation. 
And it's in those moments, and it comes almost like a, a course correction. You know, where God says, that's enough. We've got to do something here. It's not coming yet. The second coming is delayed, but I'm going to send a manifestation of my presence in such a way that it's going to be a great work of God that takes place. <clears throat> Just as David, the psalmist, is making this plea to the Lord, you know, uh, I think we should be the same way. Lord, do the same for us. We know that you're consistent in your ways, that you are for what you've always been for. You are for righteousness. You are for justice. You are for love. You are for repentance. You are for grace. God, then do that in, in our time. I mean, because look where we are. I mean, the world in general is just, it, it, it's in, it is in a terrible, I, I can't even think of the right adjective to describe just how bad the world is, it, the shape it's in right now. You look at what is happening politically across the world. You see the turmoil. You see the tensions. You're just waiting for somebody, somewhere, to do <coughs> something terrible with some nuclear device or some dirty bomb and do some terrible, horrible thing, and that will set off a, 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 a chain of events that's going to be like anything the world's ever seen before. These are, these are critical times that we're living in. These are days when the church should be praying for peace, like he's praying here for, that God would move. And throughout human history, during these times, those seem to be the moments when morality is decaying, when decency is lost, when, 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 when spirituality is at its, at its very lowest, there seems to be these extraordinary advances and these extraordinary moves of God. So we, in the midst of all this, instead of just wagging our heads and it's just terrible, I can't believe it. I mean, who ever thought we'd come to where we've come to? I mean, we're living in such a morally decadent culture. People don't get married anymore. They just live together. Not only just live together, you got men with men and women with women. I mean, it, we're living in a time when people just absolutely ignore every righteous standard that the Word of God has set forth for what is decent and what is right and what is pure. We just ignore it. We're living in an impure culture. You don't have to watch TV but 15 minutes to find that out. 15 seconds to find that out. Drive down the roads, look at the billboards. All around us, we're just surrounded with such ungodly styles of, and ways of living. It's, it, it's heartbreaking. So what was, we should do, I believe, is not say there's no hope Jesus is coming, it's all over. <clears throat> well, he is coming. But I do believe we could be praying out like these people of old did, like even the psalmist, God, send a revival. Do something to bring about a greater manifestation of your presence so that more people become aware of your glory than what had been the norm as present. Bring a great harvest. Show your mercy. Show your grace. Show your glory. Jonathan Edwards, one of the great preachers of history, he kind of wrote this on what happens when a revival comes. He said, the work of God is carried on with a greater speed in revival and with swiftness. There are often instances of sudden conversions at such times. So it was in the apostles' days when there was a time of most extraordinary pouring out of the Spirit that ever was. How quick how sudden were the conversions of those days. So it is, in some degree, whenever there's an extraordinary pouring out of the Spirit of God, that there's this powerful move of the Spirit of God. I don't want to be guilty of not asking God for that. I don't want to have a heart that becomes cold and indifferent, settled in on into mediocrity and the status quo. Nor do I believe any of you do. I really believe, I have the highest aspirations and expectations for each of you that are part of this fellowship to say, I want revival. Our church wants revival. God do something that we don't want to miss out on you doing something. And we don't want to be the people who, who you pass by. So if you're going to start a work of restoration, hey, let it start right here. Change me. Change our church. Bring thousands into the kingdom through us, God. Do something glorious with our lives in the days that we live in. God knows we need something supernatural to take place. Amen. Revival is important because to disregard it means to perhaps miss the very ways of God moving in time and eternity. Also, because without revival, we don't have any hope against the rising tide of humanism, secularism, and godlessness, atheism. It's, we're living in a culture that has completely ignored God. When you read what the psalmist says and you look at the description, he kind of lays it out in verse, verses 1. He says, you know, we're people in captivity. God set, set us free. We're in bondage. Do we not see all the captivity and the bondage around us? 
Do you not see all the lives that are torn through alcoholism and drug abuse and perversions and sexual addictions? And Do you not see all the people whose lives are being destroyed by pursuit of all the wrong things in their life? And see all the captivity and all the bondage that's in their hearts and their lives and minds? He said in verse 2, he said, Lord, we, we're, sin, we're, we're filled with sin and there's iniquity. Yeah. Verses 3 and 5, he said, God, turn your anger on. Why would God be angry? You don't think God's angry. God is angry. God, God does not approve of the way we live our lives in, this, in our nation. Amen. God is not, this is not God's plan for us. Yeah. These are not the principles upon which we founded this nation. <laughs> we did it upon principles of righteousness and holiness. And when God looks at us, I do not believe that God is smiling and singing praise songs about on our behalf. Amen. I believe that he's upset. All you have to do is turn on the evening news and look at the and, and see the moral and spiritual decay of this nation. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful things that God's doing in our midst in all of this. It's a lot of wonderful things. I've seen even the last days where churches have seen more than anybody else in this community that have suffered so much devastation in the state of Texas, even Louisiana. How many churches, how many denominations, I mean, groups like the Texas Baptist men that are going to hold community, Samaritans first, you know. I applaud these groups. And they're not getting any attention, really much from, from a secular world, but they're the ones out there who are breaking their backs, and they're the ones out there cleaning these homes out, and they're the ones who are undermining, and, I mean, not undermining, undergirding people to help them in their situation. So many of you have done the same thing to help other people. And that's what the church should be doing. But the nation is in a situation that, even though we see these good things happening, boy, we're in a time of spiritual declension in our nation like we've probably never witnessed as we are today. Such a rejection of God like we've never witnessed. Tom Rainier, who may have read his books, I think he's with Lifeway. He also was from the Billy Graham School of Missions and Evangelism. He's part of the Church Growth Strategies for the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He did this statistical study several years ago, and he found out these facts. So uh, just think from the, the year you were born, and you can apply these to where you're at in your culture. But he said, if everybody that was born before 1951, I want to ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> your group. Anybody up to, that was born before 1951, the American Evangelical Church did a really good job of reaching your culture and your, your generation. In fact, about 65% of that generation professed to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. That's phenomenal, isn't it? Not? But let's look from 1951. That was my year of birth. If you're trying to do the math, it means I'm old as dirt. Right? From 1951 to 1964, those next 15 or so, 14 or so years, the church reached 35% of that group. Now, those born between 1964, some of you, to 1977, you fall in that category? The church reached 15%. You see the difference? All right. Buckle your seatbelt. At the current rate of evangelism, those born between 1976 to 1994, we would call those the, that would be the uh, generation. generation. We got about 4% of that generation. This next generation, well, if you follow that math there, you can see not much. In fact, let me give you the way that breaks down. And this, was, it broke my heart first time I read this. That 96% of your children, and your grandchildren, and their friends, and their colleagues, 96% of them will go into eternity without God. 96% or more. Do we need revival? Yes. Do we need revival on a massive national scale? Yes, yes we do. Now again, I thank God for the work that, that happens, that people are getting saved, that people are going, coming to know Christ. But God's method... When he wants to make this course correction that we talked about, is to do an extraordinary move. That Samuel Davies, who I mentioned a while ago about the 1800s, who quoted those. That he was, a, by the way, a preacher and an early president of Princeton University. That's when it had a little more evangelical feel to it. He said, these are eras, E-R-A-S, times, when only large outpouring of the Spirit of God can produce a general public reformation. This is one of those times. We need an extraordinary move of God. And we should be asking for that in our lives and for our church. Why is it so important? The third, I said, the third reason would be this. 
because times of revival is the greatest means of God being glorified and his glory being displayed. In verse 9 he says, so that, so that your glory may dwell in our land. So the presence of God can be seen and can be testified to and be witnessed. Many people in reading historical events of great revivals always describe it as a time and a season where God's presence just seems so obvious. It's manifest and it's real, all right? And there are times in every one of our life, and I think you kind of understand what that means. You know, it's just real. You just wake up and just sense God, all right? And I believe we're in one of those times in our culture where we need to come back to that for the sake of our children, for the sake of our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, that we have this kind of move of God where this unusual measure of God's presence is just seen and felt and, 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 and obvious. Amen. His glory, he said, would be revealed. Yes. That God can only do that. Yes. But I believe that God will do it. There's a book written called uh, The Hope at Hand by David Bryant. He, he made this statement in talking about the presence of God. And he said, you know, and I'll read it. There are three levels of awareness of the presence of God. The first is a, a general or universal sense of presence. He said that we're aware that God's everywhere and he's present all the time. And we're never far from him, nor is he from us. Most people come to Christ have that general presence and the sense of presence of God that he's talking about is, you know, this, this, this universal sense. Yeah. He said, but the second sense is more specific. He says it's a cultivated nearness based on God's promises. An example would be the presence of God since when believers gather or when we call on him. His presence is felt in a very personal way. Now, I like the word he used there for a cultivated presence of God. And I think that's that, that we are, we are uh, the author Pink put this way, a theologian. He said, it's when we learn to practice the presence of God. And we do that by becoming more familiar with his promises and by more familiar with his word. And the more that we're in the word of God, the more we're spending time with God, then we're cultivating that prayer. He's there. It's universal. He's omniscient and omnipresent, right? He's everywhere. But that we're becoming, we're cultivating ourselves to be aware of God's presence. But then he said this, this other says, but there's something different that we're talking about when it comes to revival. The manifest presence of God in revival is when he suddenly breaks onto our world in special times of glory, in special times of great. When the church explodes in power, in conviction, and obedience. This manifest presence, when there's glory in the church, brings with it revival which transforms nations in powerful reformation and sweeps thousands into the kingdom of God. This is the sustained and the unusual presence of God which we see. And which we see. That God, we just see your glory revealed in the world around us. That should be our heart's cry. And I ask you today, I, you know, when, I don't know about you, but when I hear these stories of great moves of God and great awakenings and uh, you know, I could go through a long list about these great incidences and events when people are in the presence of God, about people wake up in the middle of the night and fall on their knees just aware of their sin. I need to get right with God. Nobody's necessarily in that moment preaching to them. It's everything they've heard in the past becomes now aware to them. And they're convicted by it. And people just start getting saved on every hand. God, I, I, I don't, I, that stirs up a passion in me. That stirs up a, a hunger in me. That stirs up a, a desire. I want to see God do that today. I want to see God do that in the life of my children, in the life of my grand. I want them to see that. Yes. And I've been blessed in my life to be a part of some, what I would call some great moves of the Spirit of God. Yes. But I think that those were a little temporary, a little, little season, a, a little moment. I think we saw something like that with the Jesus movement in the 70s. But I think we need something far greater and more enduring than that, where we have the sovereign work of God and His sovereign mercy and grace pour out in His, His presence in such a real way. So how do we do that? Well, that is God's work. You can't reproduce that. The Lord knows if you could, I'd have done it. Amen. You would have too, right? You can't just make that happen. But catch what the psalmist is doing in Psalms 85. He understands that the source of that is that sovereign God. And he's asking and beseeching and calling out. That's what we should be doing. God, send a great revival. Send a great revival. Let me just get, give you... A, just a couple of things to see what, what we talk about, what we're praying for. It's like in verse 1 through 3, he says, Lord, grant us restoration as in times past. Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. We know you can. History's recorded it on many occasions. Do it again. We pray like that. We pray what he says in verse 4 7. God, grant us joy. We want that love. We want that joy in our times, just like you did then. Let us experience. Grant us peace. 
Let us see your manifest presence in our time. That's what he's praying, verses 8 and 9. Verse 10 through 13, he's talking about the harmony, the unity, and the brotherhood, and the fellowship among the people of God that just causes this whole thing to even explode even more. That's what we pray for. And, that's what we, and I would encourage you to look even in your quiet time this week. Go back to Psalms 85 a couple of times. Read it again. Make a prayer of it in your own life. And as you do, I think there are some obvious steps we should take. One would be this. I think ask God to take away your fear of revival. You say, what do you mean? I think a lot of people just pray to revive it. You know? I think people just care, care to revive it. They're afraid of, what, what, what if I pray, Lord, you know, I surrender all, what's God going to do? God might call me to be a missionary to the underground church in China. God forbid. Or go off to some cannibal land. They'll send me to the cannibals. They'll eat me. That's what's going to happen. I mean, I know there are times in my life when I would say, Lord, I surrender all. And you know, Satan's, he's an artist, isn't he? He knows how to draw these wonderful, elaborate pictures in your mind of horrible things. If I say, Lord, I give you all, and all of a sudden you see in your mind a, a picture of your wife going by in a casket. Lord, I didn't mean that. Why do we think like that? Well, you know where that comes from. That comes from hell itself. Amen. The devil's a liar. Yes. God said, come, he might have life, and that life more abundant. Yes. Sometimes we act like God's trying to kill us or ruin our lives. Yes. He's trying to bring us life. Yes. Yes. We're already dead. Yes. Amen. Yes. So God, take away. Don't be afraid. God, I don't want any fear in my life. When I, when I ask you, Lord, to just to take charge, Lord, help me to understand what that really means. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Then say, Lord, I, I want to become a student of revival. I want to read your word and see what you say in your word. I want to see how you work and how you move and what you've done in times past. I mean, just take these next weeks as we're talking about revival and, and just commit yourself to praying this way and seeking God's word in this way and seeking God's ways in your life. And I believe that we'll experience, we don't see a national revival, we'll certainly see a, a community revival among our own fellowship. I think, yes, Lord, in the context of all this, as I seek you and study your word, study your, your ways and look for you, that I've become the living illustration. What the psalmist cried, Lord, revive us. Revive us again. Now, us includes himself. So when we pray us, it includes us. So the first place God desires to do reviving work is always in our heart and in my home and in my marriage. And in my relationships, yeah. and then in my church, and in my community. So, Lord, let people see that I'm filled with oil gladness, that my life is vibrant, that there's something to be desired about what I'm doing, what I've got. Yeah. I don't know what it is you got, but that's what I want. That's the idea. And I become, at that point, Lord, make me an instrument of revival. Now, I want to be an instrument of revival now. I don't want to be a hindrance, obviously. I don't want to be in the way, and I don't want to impede the progress of the Holy Spirit on any level in my life, in my home, in my church. But right now, who knows what God will do? Who knows? And if all he does in the midst of your pursuit of revival is send you a personal revival, that's well worth it. I know that, you know, I need revival. Amen. And there's probably never times that I'm not need revival on some level. But I want a revival. I want a revival in our fellowship. Yeah. And I believe it's in times like this that we can experience God even in greater measure. We can see God move in such supernatural and, and I believe almost alarming ways. But I asked the question this morning. I've shared with you my heart and my interest. How interested are you? What do you want God to do in an extraordinary way in your life? What do you want God to do in manifesting his presence where you're at? Using you as an instrument of revival where you are, in your home, in your church, on your street, in your neighborhood. Just begin to pray. Lord, stir it up in my heart. Give me a passion. Mm -hmm. Deliver me from status quo. I just don't want to be nominal yeah. in my walk with God. Yeah. I want the phenomenal. Amen. I want the Extraordinary. But it requires humility, and repentance, and brokenness, even in our own lives. Brokenness doesn't have to come to the degree that most people think it comes. Only it used to come because we don't get broken, God has to break us. But it's easier just to let the brokenness start with your own heart. So you don't have to come to that place.
Can we seek God's face for revival? I'd ask you to stand with me this morning. I'd ask you to open your heart and mind to the Lord about these matters of revival in your own life. You know that you're, you have a willingness for the Holy Spirit to come and do a work within you. I know we don't have a lot of room at this altar, but I hope we just pack it out this morning if an individual says, I want God to do something in you. If you're here today and that's your heart, then I would encourage you, I'm talking to believers, people who do know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for you to say, Lord, hear me. Show me what's wrong. Maybe you already know. You probably already have. That's the way God works in our life. Amen. It's usually never a guessing game. Lord, here's this thing in my life. Wash me. And then make me the instrument of your revival. Can you pray something like that today? Lord, I, I want to start pursuing you. Your presence in my life in a real way. I'm hungry for a deeper work of your Holy Spirit in my life. If you want to come and find a place somewhere to kneel around here, or on the edges or on the sides over there, just come right now. Find a place to pray. And if the altar gets too full, then just kneel right there where you're at. Just, you know, just, if you can't kneel, then just have a seat right there where you're at and ask God to start doing work in your life. But there's no reason why that work doesn't begin today and begin this morning in all of our lives. Let's be humble before our Heavenly Father. Let's realize that His presence is here in this room, that He's invading every thought and mind, a part of our life. He knows everything that's going on, everything we're dealing with, and everything we're, we're really in. Let's make our interest in them. Just between you and me, Father, Lord, let a human being do a work in my life. Do a work in my heart. Do a work here. There's some other need. You want someone to pray with you? And they're here in the altar. They're here to pray with you, pray for you. Why don't you come? Maybe you need to give your life to Jesus. I had one lady who came to me today, probably in her mid-40s, who came broken in the service at the first service and said, listen, I don't know God. I don't want to go into eternity without God in my life. I need to give my heart to Christ. Gave her life. Let that be described to you today. Why don't you come? Let me pray with you. Rejoice in a new life that begins today because you're making a decision. It'll never happen. None of this ever happens until you make choices. You've got to make a choice. Make the right choice. Would you come be obedient to the Lord? Let's, let's, let's just worship the Lord. Let's sing and pray.
handbasket. Just saying God is good all the time. Amen. 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 We're going to use this as a platform for witnessing. Let Kim Jong mentally ill, whatever his name is. <laughs> and what he's going to do, we're going to praise the Lord anyway. Hallelujah. That is something ill, isn't it? Y'all be seated. God is good. These are exciting days. We're going to continue talking about these topics of revival, but more so experiencing revival in our hearts and lives. I'm really excited because next Sunday is National Back to Church Sunday. And I'm sure the world really pays close attention to that. But we're going to draw their attention to it. I'm going to ask every one of you to be focused on next Sunday service with prayer, going to pray now, to faith, believing God to do something great. Amen? We'll, uh, we'll see God fill this place up. Praise the Lord, we have a, a very good group. We wouldn't have any seats in this room with those folks that went to Magnolia this morning and stayed here and come here. So I appreciate with them. Now, if you want to switch off with some of this, I missed you Sunday. If you were in Magnolia, I'll take your place next Sunday. So you know, share the load with us. Amen? Share the burden. But uh, thank the Lord. But next Sunday... Uh, people are getting back to the norm of life, at least in this part of the world. Uh, I expect that we're going to be using our overflow area that we're, we're developing downstairs in the lobby. But uh, I want you to invite people to come to church. We have some invite cards. And, uh, everything's been put away because all the dust and stuff, so there's no telling where they are. So you're going to have to use your invite now. <laughs> Y'all know where that is, right? You didn't lose it. Amen. Open your mouth. Invite somebody. Ask God to put that on your heart and mind. Think about even now and be praying now about who you can get here. I shared with our leaders meeting Friday night, there's no reason in the world we, we can't fill these rooms up, amen? Hopefully just a couple more weeks. We have painters coming in for the worship center uh, tomorrow. Praise the Lord. And we have uh, sheet rockers coming in. And the good thing about the worship center is we took off the sheet rock off the backside where all the offices and all the other rooms are. So we can get in there sooner than, than later in, 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 the, in the building. So hopefully two more Sundays at most will be out of that. Uh, the painters are coming in. The carpets, praise the Lord, as we, we thought with that large an order that we would have to mill it. And uh, we called them and said they, they wanted to know what, what we were looking at, what we needed. We told them. And they said, you know, that's one of the only the few things we have left in stock. And so that, uh, that, that, so that was a God thing. Amen. So Amen. the Lord led us in that decision of what that was. So uh, that's, that's being prepared. And, and ready for the trucks to get down here. So as soon as they're finished painting in there, uh, we're remodeling some other things that we're in this process, doing some things on the stage. We're changing out. I know many of you hate the lighting in that worship center, so all that's being changed out too in the next couple of weeks as well. So we'll have better lighting, dimmable lighting, those kind of things, better stage lighting. All that's coming in. Um, trying to improve the sound system as well. So there's a lot that's going on, but uh, praise the Lord. So let's just, if we're uncomfortable up here, and these aren't the most comfortable chairs in the world, I know that, praise the Lord. But Realize there's people sitting on wooden benches this morning in churches with no air conditioners, and we are stinking blessed. <laughs> so let's enjoy the blessings and not complain about it, but let's bring people with us, all right? Just let them know, hey, hey we got a pretty cool church. You know, we're doing a lot, you know, a lot of churches are refusing to do these days. If they ask what it is, I'll just see. <laughs> and bring them to church with them. Get them excited about what.